Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time. Back for what is quickly becoming one of my favorite videos of the week. It's where Millennial Mike goes through all of the comments and pulls out the juicy, the detailed, the ones that uh, he would like me to go deeper in. So first and foremost, I thank you. The audience thanks you for doing this. It's amazing that you will spend your time doing this for us. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, what do you got today? Yeah. So for this one, we have, we got a lot of questions. The, the student loan forgiveness program, government program that the Biden administration just passed or touted is dropping and that's causing some controversy. So believe it or not, the video that you did on that this morning already was racking up questions. So I threw a couple in there. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about crashes, fed rate cuts, a really angry commenter, Mr. Jay Crawford, who's just going after you in every video, it seems like. Yeah. We're going to get to all of this. So we're going to start with student loan forgiveness and bank bailouts. So okay. Fabiola Antoine, she goes, she asks, are there comparisons between the bank bailouts of 2008 and the student loan forgiveness bailout? Now, how do both of these impact the economy? So um, let's just realize that this is a talk track uh, that is coming out. I try to be neutral on everything. Uh, this is a talk track coming out saying, hey, I got mine, but you got yours before, you know, all of that nonsense. So let's talk about bank bailouts. Let's be very, very clear. If the if the government, the Federal Reserve, central banks didn't come out and bail our economy out in 2008 and the economy was left to its own devices, we would have gone through the second Great Depression. Now, we are 12 years past it, and undoubtedly we would be in a different spot, probably a healthy economy. We would have paid for a lot of our sins, but it would have been the second Great Depression. So I will leave it to you to decide if it's better or worse. There, There is an argument to say that we should have gone through the Great Depression. We'd be better off today. I agree with that argument. It, it probably is true, but it would not have been fun. The Great Recession was a bad for lots of people. It would have been worse for a lot more. So I don't see them as equal. There's a lot of people trying to say, hey, you bailed out the rich. Now you're bailing out everybody else. You know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they're not equal. They're the, comparing the the bank bailout to this is is not a fair comparison. There was worldwide economic depression was the other choice. I don't know if it was right or wrong, but that's what it was. Uh, this uh, student loan bailout, I don't really care one way or the other. It is inflationary. Let's just take that off the table. It is absolutely inflationary. It is absolutely unfair. But life's never been fair, so I'm I'm not sure about that argument. Uh, we are asking people who didn't go to college. Uh, we are asking people who um, paid off their debt. We are uh, asking people like my wife and I who paid for our daughter's education um, to suck it up, right? We're all taxpayers. And, you know, the total student loan forgiveness now is running at $800 billion, $300 billion from this, this 10 and 20K, but also the interest. That's, that's almost a trillion dollars. And it is inflationary. It is stimulus. We are giving four months of stimulus. There are people that had bills to pay that are being told not to pay until January. Folks, that is stimulus. That is inflationary. You can argue if it's good or bad. I'm not going to, I don't want to place judgment. It is inflationary. So uh, A, I don't think it's a fair comparison. Uh, I certainly wouldn't have wanted to go through a Great Depression. 12 years later, maybe we'd be in a better spot. Uh, but yeah, they're not a fair comparison, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that they're they're equal. Uh, one, whether you think it's right or wrong, one preventing a Great Depression versus student loans is a, is a big big difference right there. Mm -hmm. All right, staying on this topic though, Ninja Vanish twenty four seven, great username. Mm -hmm. He asks, I think the student loan forgiveness announcement will put more pressure on the Fed to increase rates or at least keep them high for longer. What do you think, Zuber? Oh, well, first and foremost, if you were watching what's called the, um, there's basically a, 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 a forward interest rate targets. Uh, you're absolutely right. It, it spiked the day, the morning that uh, Biden mm -hmm. announced this. Uh, I don't remember what the numbers were, but they were basically at 3-1 and they jumped to like 3-3. Three, three, so they were open noticeably. This is inflationary, folks. It just is. You are asking people who have debt payments not to pay debt, which means they can use that money elsewhere. It's inflationary. And yes, I think this will put more pressure on the Fed 
uh, because it's inflationary. It's 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 like handing people it's like handing forty million people four hundred bucks a month. It's just inflationary. It just is, and the Fed's got a hard enough job. So I I I not only think you're logically correct. I think the market priced that in almost immediately. So I think uh, I think Ninja's right. Um, another question on this topic, Janet Harold. She asks, "Isn't debt forgiveness technically taxable income, just like a short sale?" Oh, you're absolutely correct under normal conditions. Uh, but something they did, I think it was in the Job Act, is they, uh, at least at the federal level, they've waived uh, the tax implications of debt forgiveness on student loans through 2025. So first and foremost, you and I should be afraid because this is now proven to be done. They could do it again. And again, this is not taxable at the federal level. It might be taxable at the some state levels. Many states follow the federal law, i.e. will waive them till 2025, but not all states. So check your state. You may be impacted by debt forgiveness. She's absolutely correct, except, of course, the government waived it till 2025. Mm -hmm. All right. So sort of related to the same topic, talking about the inflation and Fed rates, Hacker asks, and this is a little bit of a longer one. He goes, mm -hmm. I agree if the Fed doesn't follow through with rate hikes that we would see inflation that could lead to civil unrest, food insecurity. But I'm a bit confused by what our government is doing. I'm not an economist, but doesn't our government need to stop with the spending sprees? At the same time, the Fed is raising interest rates in order to ease inflation. Or can we somehow continue to spend more money at w one thing without seeing the inflation on the other side? Um, so again, there's a lot kind of nuanced in that. In, in general, the government is spending too much money. Uh, the government is racking up debt. However, if you do look at the last year, Again, I don't I haven't looked at the math, but the national debt has gone down slightly. I don't again, I don't understand the math. I think that's kind of like California's budget that had a huge surplus when we had a hot stock market. Does anybody think we have a hot stock market the last year? I think I think California is in for a surprise drop in tax revenue. I, I suspect the Fed is kind of the same thing. We had a good two year run, which led to a lot of sales. Sales lead to a lot of uh, taxes. So I think I think it was kind of artificial. But yeah, the government's spending too much money. Too much money means too much debt. A rising debt environment means interest payments go up. He's absolutely correct. Uh, that said, you know, the government thinks in, you know, 12 month, 18 month chunks and they're not focused there. But but he's he, eventually it's becomes a big problem. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes the party in power needs a Hail Mary pass as they come up on midterm elections and sometimes. they got to throw people a bone <laughs> uh, or bribe. I mean, you can call it a bribe. I'm right. sure they won't call it a bribe, but many, <laughs> many others are calling it a bribe. Yeah. Uh, OK. Angry Jay Crawford. The crash yeah. is coming, man. Jay yeah. Crawford, at least he's angry. He's helping, dude, he helps the algorithm because he is just sometimes I'll get three comments per one of your videos as he's listening to some point you make responds next like three I, minute segment i get a lot there's a lot of haters that that they don't like to hear transaction crash there's no price crash they just they they freaking they don't they ate they don't understand how important this is what pisses me off before we get into his question sure sure i called a transaction crash when no one else did and it's already happening first off nobody wants to give me credit for that Second, nobody wants to understand that a real estate crash in transaction could pull our economy into a recession. These are things that I know for certain. It's just they happen. Everybody is focused on all these other channels calling for a price decline. And folks, I don't see it. And for all of you people out there who say you're in real estate, of course, you want prices to go up. You're freaking nuts. You don't know who I am. I want a 50% crash. My channel would be bigger if I would just be stupid enough and intellectually dishonest to call one. I don't see it. I would love to see it. I just don't see it. And it pisses people off like Jay. Yeah. The You think that we don't want the crash? Dude, you come realize, on. I would love one. Dude, the crash hurts you as the home buyer. You think if the knife is falling, if housing prices are dropping 10% month over month consistently, that you're going to be able to qualify for lending? You think a lender is going to borrow you money on a failing asset? You're screwed. You know who isn't screwed? Big real estate investors with cash 
who can swoop in and buy stuff up. A crash helps us. You might think it's going to help you. It ain't going to help you because it's going to be crashing and you're not going to get lending for anything. So. I, you know, some someday, I I I should put out a, the world is ending, the real estate's going to crash, and watch my YouTube channel blow up. But I'm just not intellectually dishonest that way. Sometimes yeah, I wonder if I should just like April Fools joke it and see what happens. And then make sure that all your thumbnails have burning cities in the back. <laughs> exactly. So uh, the burning that's house. A pro tip. <laughs> it has to be red, yellow with a burning house. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. Angry Jay Crawford, who I'm glad you comment, but here's your, here is your three paragraphs. I'll condense oh. it. He goes, you cherry pick your data to fit your narrative. You say <laughs> for... You say foreclosures are up as much as they are because we had two years where they weren't allowed, but you refuse to acknowledge that prices will not come down because of those same two years of extremely unnatural appreciation. How does that make any sense? So foreclosures are only up because we had two years with no foreclosures. Yeah, well, we had artificial inflation that caused everything to go up, and that's going to come back down now as well. So, Mike, explain to us why the artificial inflation that we saw isn't going to recede and result in crashes because the federal reserve broke the housing market the housing market for 40 years was uh kind of like a flow chart right you 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 become an adult you go to college or you get a job you save up some money you buy your first home you live in that home for five to eight years you get married you have kids whatever you move up that was the natural order Unfortunately, by the Federal Reserve keeping rates too low for too long, it obviously had a, you know, if you look at the national averages, 40% appreciation. That's unnatural. I fully agree. That is unnatural. But unfortunately, 98% of residential buyers got fixed rate loans. 73%, if memory serves, have 4% or below. 50% have 3.5% or below. And 13% have 3% or below. The natural order of the home buying process is broken. For years, Jay, the move up buyer is not going anywhere, which means you're losing two transactions. You're not going to sell the first time home and you're not going to buy the next one. So Jay, people are, you have a lot less demand and you have a lot less supply. So there's just not going to be any transactions. People aren't going to move. They're just going to, they're going to buy, go buy bunk beds. And I, I make that joke. And I interviewed Lance Lambert, a Fortune magazine editor. And, I, and he's in this situation. He bought a new home in Raleigh or Nashville or somewhere. And he's like, my wife's pregnant. I should have bought a bigger one. I'm like, you're going to go buy bunk beds now because you're not moving. He's like, you're absolutely <laughs> right. So Jay, you angry son of a gun, get off your freaking high horse and realize that the housing market is flat out broken. For years, I'm sorry you missed the bottom and you listened to these other channels who told you not to buy at the best time. 2020 and 2021 were mathematically the best years to buy. I'm sorry you listened to renters who no told you not to buy. Sorry, bud. You're stuck. Yeah. And we're going to kind of stay on this topic uh, because crash and transactions does seem to trigger a lot of people. And Dan D, who I think actually asked this from a, from a legitimate like point of he wants an explanation. He's not just trying to be angry. Dan D says, does anyone really care about a housing transaction crash? I just want to know if and if so, when housing prices come down. So he's, why does the why does the crash and transactions matter? And then if that matters, if and when do housing prices come down as a result of it eventually? Those are, those are, unfortunately, those are two very different questions. So first and foremost, I believe that most people should care about a transaction crash and don't. I call the transaction crash early. I warned people in the real estate industry to get ready. I tried to save people. The real estate market, the housing market, makes up 15% of our GDP. Think about that. If you have a 50% crash in transactions, that's potentially 5 to 7% off of our national GDP. That is recessionary. That's damn near depressionary. right? This is significant. And yes, I know that YouTube videos from renters have conditioned you to look for a price crash because they told you not to buy before and before and before. 
I believe a real estate tra tra transaction crash will lead to the U.S. economy entering a recession. I believe that is important. I believe that is statistically relevant. I believe it will create amazing opportunities for people who can find motivated sellers and do the work. I am more excited because of a transaction crash because I'm willing to do the work where most people are going to whine and cry and sit on the couch. Now, a price crash. Price crash could theoretically follow a transaction crash. Transaction crash is easier to see, but nobody called it except me. I will tell you if interest rates continue to rise up and the 30-year loan hits 7, 8, 9%, you could see price deterioration. Absolutely. I believe we're going to see rates in the sixes for most of the rest of the year. I think we could see the sevens next year. I believe at that point, the U.S. economy will be in a recession. And as always, the Fed cuts rates. So we won't be in the sevens very long. And thus, you won't get the huge pricing crash, nationally speaking. That said, there are some markets that are unquestionably dominated by iBuyers and investors. Those markets, Phoenix, Vegas, had unnatural 15 20% extra. They're going to come in. Las Vegas, it is estimated that the last year, 43% of transactions were investors. That's not normal. It would not shock me if Phoenix is the same way. It is far more normal to be about 21 or 22%. So we're talking double normal. That's going to come in. We will see some price discrepancies. But uh, there are channels that have been calling for a crash for two years in a row. They are still calling for a crash in November. I don't, ha I don't know how they do it. Some of them now are saying next year. I it doesn't matter nationally. Folks, go look at your buy box. How many pendings? How many active? How days on markets? Do your job. Stop waiting for some kid who's a renter in his mom's basement to tell you when the market's going to crash. Get off your ass and do the work yourself. Days on, Go look at your buy box, then year on year, then month on month. It's it, Real estate is so seasonal. Month on month, these folks are looking at interesting, but not relevant. So uh, it, it makes me upset that people are focused on a price crash like that's the answer. A transaction crash is relevant. It could, it could be so bad to pull the entire country into a recession, folks. I think that's bad. And if you don't, then we disagree. Right. Okay. Staying sort of with this topic, um, one of the only things that we've talked about that could lead to a more quick or sudden crash in actual values or prices of homes mm -hmm. would be if unemployment started to skyrocket. For instance, in the Great Recession, 2009, unemployment peaked at 10%. Currently, mm -hmm. we're around 3.3, which is all-time historic 3. lows. 3.5, but... Okay. 3.5, excuse me. All-time historic lows. Mm -hmm. um, so the question here about unemployment concerns from E7 Gomez, he says, I don't think unemployment's going to tick higher, at least not during the rest of this year for the holiday season. He says, do you see a scenario where we get rising unemployment before 2023? No. Well, I, I don't. It, it, I think there's a chance that unemployment could see three six three seven by the end of the year, and that would actually be people coming off the market. Right there's there's this whole U three U six. Are you are you looking? Are you not looking? It's not going to go up meaningful. Uh, I mean, we're at 1969 record lows, three point five. It's the second time we've been here. Uh, it's record low. So, mm -hmm. just mathematically, anytime you're at the outer bound. The chances are it goes up from there, but it won't go up meaningful. It just doesn't have time to go up meaningful. He's correct. Right. Yeah. So again, the, the purpose of that question is, you know, one of the reasons why we had price crashes in 2007, eight, nine was forced sellers, people who had to sell because they were underwater. They lost their job. They couldn't make their payment. So it, people talk about rising inventory. Well, even though inventory is rising, it's still, it's still half of what a normal healthy. Well, I want to, I want to push, I want to push back on that. Cause I think that is a talk track pushed uh, on YouTube world. I am very afraid, Mike, that inventory is rolling over right now. We're going to end August potentially with less inventory than we did July. We will mm -hmm. certainly end September with less inventory than August. We are heading into the seasonally slow period and anybody hoping for and begging for and wanting a crash you have to also be betting for inventory to jump 
And I think you're going to be greatly disappointed. It's just not in the cards, guys. It's just the Fed broke housing. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got a couple more questions here. Now, to your point earlier, when you talked about how people need to do the work in their market, we talk about national real estate numbers, but nobody buys a house nationally. Everything's local. So Shauna Bibb, she asks, what would you think about if your buy box had a month over month price decrease of negative 2.9 for June and negative 2.3 for July? Should you be looking at this as a good time to buy? Yeah, uh, again, two monthly, uh, two month on month decline doesn't tell me anything whether it's a good time to buy. They could all still be alligators, all still negative cash flow. It's interesting information. Uh, what I would certainly do is I would lower any of my offers. Again, I don't know price points or anything based mm -hmm. on that question. But if you're in a declining market, your buy box is declining, dude. I'm, I'm not a raging housing bull. I'm not here telling you it's going to go up 10, 15, 20 percent. I've never said that. I think housing is going to be flat. If you happen to be in a market, maybe it's Phoenix, Arizona, and it's declining month on month, and it, it'll decline month on month. Get cheaper. Get more aggressive. Write better offers. Use the momentum. Sellers will eventually get scared. If your market goes down 2%, 2%, 2%, write better offers, which mean lower prices. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, question that you got emailed to you. And again, if folks want to have their questions answered in this segment between Mike and my, Mike and myself, you can Instagram videos to me. I have a video someone sent that we might react to later. You can email me questions or leave them down in the comment section. But this guy, uh, Blue Milan, emailed this question to you. He says, I'm from Orange County and want to invest here. My question is, would I be wiser to invest outside of Orange County first while my cash reserves are not where they will be in a year from now? So this is a great question I get versions of all the time. Basically, hey, I live in an expensive part of the world. Numbers don't work. I want to go out of state. So my answer always is what I teach with one rental at a time is a skill. It is most it is easiest to learn this skill in your backyard regardless of price point. So this gentleman I believe is from Orange County. So I would tell you to go spend the next 60 or 90 days, get a buy box in Orange County and do the work. At the end of 90 days, you should be able to tell someone, hey, the average yield in my buy box is negative 5%. Now that you have that skill, you know the network, you know the questions, you walk through properties, you know these things, it is easier to learn that out of state or out of area. If you try to learn a brand new skill out of state or out of area, it is ridiculously hard. It could take a year and you may not learn it. I strongly suggest everybody appreciate what I try to teach with one rental at a time is learn your backyard. Olivia and I did the same thing. I've told everybody and their brother, my story starts by wasting a year looking in the Bay Area. It was only after, again, a year of looking every Sunday for 52 weeks that we finally stumbled on Fresno, California. I could not have learned Fresno, California as fast as I did unless I learned the skill of learning my Bay Area market. So I would tell everybody, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to teach you a skill. It's kind of like a golf swing. You can go learn a golf swing on any driving range in America. I would tell you it's better to do it in your backyard. But once you have a swing, you could take it to any golf course in the country. Kind of the same thing. So People are asking the wrong question. They're trying to find the market first, and I'm trying to teach you a skill first. So learn the skill, then the market. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Oh, I think that's a great point. I think our natural proclivity is to try to find a way to simplify things and make them easier and avoid doing as much work as we should. But sometimes it's important for your own safety and your own education to make sure that you're prepared to just do the work, do the work, develop the skill. Yeah, right. Exactly. On the hat, didn't even recognize you had that one on today. Mike, those were all the questions that we had. We do have a couple of reactionary videos that we're going to do uh, in another segment. So that's all I had for you from the comments. Thank you very much for doing this. I, again, meant what I said. I look forward to this every week there. You know, as somebody who doesn't have a team or a bunch of VAs or whatever running around, I still go through all my comments. I usually respond with one word answers. I'm sorry. Uh, so the fact that you find the meaty ones and the hate, the fact that you found Jay's, continue to find that stuff. I don't mind. As long as you're respectful and it's not full of cuss words and you're not, if, if you want to take me on, that's great. But if you want to take on one of my guests, you'll probably be blocked. It's just my guests don't, they give us an hour each week. They don't deserve the hate. 
Um, but yeah, those are kind of the rules. I don't mind disagreement. It's fine. Keep going, Jay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you don't understand and you're still sitting on the couch. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Mike. Yep.